Issue 44. We start out with Rhoda showing Sonic his new really large ray gun, and then saying to Sonic's disappointment that he's only going to use it in extreme situations. Why? Does it have really limited ammo? Really scarce ammo? Ammo that's lasers? Or does it just cause way too much collateral damage? When they usually don't operate near buildings anyway, so usually in fields and stuff. And I thought Rotor said pun and not fun there, because the font looked weird, it just barely didn't look like a P. It's odd that I expected that, since the comic has mostly ditched puns, as it should. An alarm happens, telling Rotor with the monitor that something bad's happened on the floating island. And everyone gets into the plane to go there, with Antoine complaining that no one knows how to relax in their day off. Antoine, why would you ever expect anybody in the Freedom Fighters to get to have an actual day off? Also, considering the weird glasses he's wearing, I'm guessing he's the pilot. But Tails has shown that he can fly a plane too. The Sonic 3 adaptation, remember? So why is Tails being robbed of one of his only talents? It's bad enough that Bunny can fly too. It should be Tails flying this plane. Or at least Rotor. Well, just because he's a kid? Antoine... Antoine being the pilot doesn't make any sense. We cut to Knuckles saying that the only reason there would be a quake on Angel Island is if someone was messing with the Chaos Chamber, which would cause the island to start falling. Scourge? So if he got here that early in the comic before, and with Knuckles miles away instead of sitting in front of the Emerald like he fucking should be, then why the hell did it take so long for him to be able to use the Master Emerald to turn green and stuff? He should have been able to do it right here! I'm guessing Knuckles has his own form of super speed, just like in the games. Because otherwise we'd have a situation where by the time Knuckles would be encountering the Quake, you'd think the Quake would have symbolized the Emerald having already been taken, and thus powering Scourge up. Either that or Scourge got into the Chaos Chamber and just stood there doing nothing until Knuckles showed up, while an earthquake happened for no reason. I'm guessing the Chaos Emerald in the Chaos Chamber isn't as powerful as the Master Emerald, and so it can't power Scourge up into its green iconic form. Even though even one Emerald has been stated to have infinite power, so it would just it would be just as powerful as the Master Emerald, wouldn't it? What could be stronger than infinite? Anyways, I'm glad to see Scourge again. For some reason, Knuckles' twin from Anti-Mobius is also here, even though he's not actually friends with Scourge. Which is a shame, because if Anti-Knuckles and Scourge were like best friends, that would have been an interesting contrast between Scourge and Sonic. Not to mention it makes sense, since, especially in the Archie Sonic comics, Sonic and Knuckles have very similar personalities, both being impatient, short-tempered, and prone to attacking first and asking questions later. The only difference is that Knuckles is more serious than negative. So why wouldn't Scourge and Anti-Knuckles be friends then? Only reason Sonic and Knuckles hate each other is because thanks to Eggman they got off the wrong foot. And Archie Sonic has a harder time letting go of a grudge, I guess. Huh, so this version of Knuckles is Scottish, alright then. It's another dimension, so it makes sense that people's counterparts would have grown up in different cultures, in different countries. Or maybe the Scottish culture would be positioned in a different part of the world. So Anti-Mobius just happens to have a Scottish Angel Island. Maybe there, the Scottish immigrated to the place that would, would become the Floating Island, and interbred with the Echidnas until they became Scottish too. Or the Echidnas were Scottish all along. Maybe with their homeland being in Scotland. Who knows? Anti-Knuckles and Scourge go back through their portal without getting what they came for because of two arbitrary bullshit things. One, their portal is starting to close, because apparently the portal they created is a dick who put them on a time limit for chits and giggles. Why didn't Scourge just go by the cosmic interstate again? And two, I guess Anti-Knuckles and Scourge honestly thought that they couldn't overpower Knuckles by gaining up on him? Bullshit! Scourge has super speed, so he could just steal the emerald at super speed while Anti-Knuckles was fighting with his twin. Worst case scenario, Scourge could abuse his super speed to snap his neck. But obviously he didn't want to do that. Archimedes rushes to lecture Knuckles for having not stayed at the Emerald side the whole time. And when Knuckles points out the plot hole that News shouldn't be able to travel that fast, Archimedes hand waves it as, There are many things you still don't know about me, Knuckles. What, was he here all along and just couldn't be seen because he's so small and was hiding? 
Then why the hell didn't he come out of hiding and use his fire breath on Knuckles' enemies to be useful? Sally shows up with Sonic and Tails and says that her satellites showed that Knuckles might be having some problems. How? Can satellites see earthquakes? Why doesn't Eggman just locate Knothole by satellite imaging to find those huts in the Great Forest? Well, okay, maybe the unwooded areas those huts are in are just too small. And satellite images are so far away from the world's surface, Eggman would have to zoom in a lot. And zooming in doesn't increase the resolution, so his image of the huts might just be too blurry for him to tell what they are. Sonic runs along the cosmic interstate. Why didn't Scourge go through that place? Through the same entrance he went through with all of his friends? Instead, he had to rely on a portal that was on a time limit. Or maybe the portal was generated by just going through the interstate normally. Like that was the only way to get to Mobius. What? Knuckles says Sonic doesn't know about his and Sally's history together and Sally's knowledge of the floating island because of it. And Sally says he's right? Uh, no, he does know. He learned that pretty clearly and wasn't happy about it. Is Sally lying to him? About time, if that's the case. She's too pure good most of the time. She tells him that she's protected Knuckles' secret along with many others. We would travel to locations only my father knew of. Um, I'm pretty sure with satellite imaging and cartographers mapping out the world, there is no location of Mobius that only the royal family would know of. And here's some more bullshit. If they knew about the floating island, which based on the previous panel we are expected to believe only the royal family knew of, how could Sally have thought that her father and her were alone? If you know about the floating island, how could you not know about the echidnas that were living there? It was only after I wandered off my own that you revealed yourself to me. Okay, that's bullshit too. Knuckles is not the type to just sit and wait when he's got trespassers on his island. He'd be jumping out of the bushes threatening her and the king the minute he'd see them. Not waiting for them to cause trouble and steal his emerald. And apparently Sally couldn't speak of her friendship with Knuckles to anyone lest she let her father know that he broke the rules of his apprenticeship. What rules? How? What is one of those rules you're not allowed to be friends with anyone? Or no friendship with an outsider? So not only is his father someone who abandoned him, but he's a father who either horribly restricted his son's social life for no reason, so that he'd be socially stunted, or a father who is racist against anyone who's not from Angel Island. So Sonic has been running along the cosmic interstate while Knuckles and the Freedom Fighters were following him in a plane. I guess he was running slower to let them keep up, and in that case the only point of him running at all was because he just likes running. Sure it's convenient that they were able to find a portal to the cosmic interstate that easily, and they, and they don't even question it. Now on Anti-Mobius, Rotor has his ro remote scanner fly over the forest and transmit back to him whatever it will see. Ha! Huh, I love it! Sonic actually says, Don't you find it ironic that we depend so much on technology in our fight against a technological enemy? See, this is the kind of self-awareness that's good. It works perfectly in-universe, while being a witty remark, and it's less bland than just saying, Well, that's the way things always are around here. He beats you every time. I wasn't expecting them to actually point this out, and Rotor just says casually to fight fire with fire. I always liked how this was the case, as it helps prevent the Freedom Fighters from appearing to be totally against technology by relying on an engineer on a regular basis, so it doesn't send the wrong message. Scourge and Anti-Knuckles jump out of the bushes for an ambush, because I guess they returned home through the same portal as them and waited here expecting them to show up. That must have been boring for them. Sonic and Scourge don't really have a satisfying fight though, since they keep dodging each other's attacks with a super speed again. Meaning them both having super speed cancels each other out and removes the benefits of them both having it. Even if Scourge wanted to just grab Sonic and snap his neck at super speed, I guess he wouldn't be able to because he just missed that attack too. After Tails says he's bored of watching them fight each other too equally matched to make any progress, and Rotor says he's enjoying watching the different fighting styles because he's totally an expert on fighting styles, Anti-Knuckles finally decides to give up, saying that he'd really hate himself if he killed Knuckles. So his evil twin really isn't that evil after all. This is how you develop an evil twin's character instead of making them too much of a cliché. Rather than just being evil Knuckles, he's Knuckles if he was Scottish. He says that he never should have resorted to violence for any reason. 
Worst Guardian ever. Even Knuckles lampshades this. Knuckles! So his evil twin is a pacifist. Uh, who is the evil twin again? Not that I'm complaining, Knuckles isn't really pure good in this comic anyways. Anti-Knuckles, who I just noticed also has a mustache at like age 10, says that someone is draining the energy from the Chaos Emeralds that sustains Zyland. Not sure why he didn't immediately jump to the conclusion that it was Boomer. And I quote, If we can't restore the energy, soon all will perish. Without, uh, first of all, we. So Scourge has convinced him that he cares about preventing all that from happening, and that's why they were working together. That, or he means, he means we as in, I want all of you to help. That wouldn't be too ridiculous since if all will perish, then that would include Scourge himself, wouldn't it? Why would Scourge want his own world to die if that would include himself or inconvenience himself? Maybe he's going behind Boomer's back, who knows? Second, there really should be a comma before the all there. And third, really? All will perish if Anti-Angel Island falls. I guess the rules are pretty different here. Apparently, when Anti-Angel Island falls from the sky, it explodes and destroys the entire world in a nuclear explosion. Let me sound like I'm complaining a lot, but really I'm not having a field day with this issue. The problems just make reviewing it a lot more fun. I love Knuckles' response to this. That's not worth fighting for? You wimp! You're an embarrassment to echidnas everywhere. Because apparently echidnas and anti-mobias are pacifists. Despite needing to guard an emerald. How do they expect to guard it then? With flowers and rainbows? Also, also, from what he's saying, there are still multiple Chaos Emeralds in the Anti-Angel Island's Chaos Chamber. So there, the Dimitri event never happened, destroying the Chaos Emeralds. Maybe that's why the Echidnas there are pacifists and stuff. But if the Dimitri event never happened, logically, since in the reverse world he'd have been a good guy, shouldn't the ultra-advanced Echidna society still exist? and be a major global power? I wish I got to see that. That sounds like a really interesting facet of Anti-Mobius. But wait, if Dimitri was the good guy, then his nice brother wouldn't have, would, have been, would have been the bad guy. So the same thing would have happened, wouldn't it have? When Knuckles says Anti-Guardian is the guardian of his island, he says that he is. So I guess the Dimitri incident did happen. Either that or they were smart enough to have had guardians for the Emeralds all along, which would have prevented the Dimitri incident. But then Anti-Knuckles goes on to say that his island is actually submerged under the sea in an air containment field, which is running out of energy. Whoa, this is a fascinating concept! It makes perfect sense, it was just as likely that Angel Island would have been chosen to fly as it was to have been chosen to sink. Both would have worked just fine. Huh, maybe on Anti-Mobius, Echidna Polis was on an island all along, and so they were able to sink it to avoid the White Meteor. Anyway, so that's all he means when he says all will perish. He's been just as echidna-centered as that one echidna who said, It's the end of the world! At the prospect of just Echidnopolis being destroyed. It's not all, it's just Angel Island. And I guess Boomer found this island with a submarine then, to meet Anti-Knuckles in the first place. Or Boomer just used this, because it seems this Angel Island is open to any visitors. So how did the Anti-Freedom Fighters even get to meet Anti-Knuckles in the first place? Anti-Knuckles would have no reason to leave his advanced city, so why would he even meet him? I guess they decided to go try to steal their emeralds, I guess. And Atlantopolis. That's a much prettier name than the clunky Echidnopolis. Plus, it implies, again, that not only are they less, you know, arrogant, because, you know, they're not naming the entire city after themselves, Echidna Polis, but it implies that Echidna Polis, in all its advanced technology, still exists in Antimobius instead of having been destroyed from a weird science vendetta. I will be so disappointed that, that, that that's not true, because that would be an amazing contrast between Mobius and Antimobius, in more ways than just moralities reversed. Sonic says that the air in Atlanta Polis is too thick, even though the whole problem is that the air is running out because of the emeralds being drained, wouldn't the problem be that the air is too thin because there's not enough of it? And Broder says the air will get even thicker. This is so backwards. And look! Tall metal buildings! It's like a kid Nepal's never got destroyed! Wait a minute, is Scourge's 
The Scourge is still here? Okay then, I guess the Freedom Fighters trust him to come along. You'd think they wouldn't want him in the plane. Nicole's uses the Duke's Ex Machina, who magically knows exactly where they should go next, even though she sh shouldn't really have access to the internet of an entirely different world to get a GPS scan of the place. Seriously, how the hell do her magic powers even work? Then it's revealed that it was Robotnik, and not Boomer, who was draining the Emeralds' power. It makes perfect sense that Robotnik would do this. Maybe he thinks this world would put up less resistance. But you'd think that Scourge, in his absolute misery at how boring and unchallenging his life is, would jump at the opportunity to fight Robotnik. Especially without his good twin there to glow at how he's doing something heroic. So why did Scourge go try to steal some emeralds from a different world instead of just drop-kicking Robotnik right then and there? Seriously, though, I'm exhausted by this point. Do we really have to have the villain always be Eggman? This is another dimension! This is getting ridiculous at this point. This could have been a great opportunity to give Boomer the spotlight as the villain. Not to mention make an interesting character conflict where Scourge opposes his plan. Eggman breaks that now, all of a sudden he has the power to create interdimensional doorways whenever he wants without arousing the citizenry. First off, that's pretty overpowered and sudden. Second, I betcha this power isn't gonna show up again. Or at least not soon. So that's just gonna be dropped off. And, and third, Arousing? I'm not surprised anyone can use this word in this day and age without meaning, you know. You'd think Eggman would prefer to say it attracting their attention instead to avoid the risk of being made fun of. Why would he care anyways? Isn't he an attention whore who would love attracting attention? Doesn't he want to get people to notice and fear him? There isn't any war, so they chalk up whatever disturbance I make to being a natural occurrence. So what, the echidnas are assuming that the emeralds are being drained because they're throwing a hissy fit and draining themselves? Do you think evil spirits are doing it? Scourge intrigues me and then immediately bores me by saying like a cliched evil twin that he wished he had thought of at first, exploiting his world. Even though he himself would have absolutely nothing to gain from doing what Eggman's doing. He wouldn't have access to technology to power up like that unless he used boomers, and even then, if they drained the emeralds too much, the Alon would run out of air and make himself die of oxygen deprivation. Because yes, all will perish, including the person who caused the whole thing in the first place. Ugh. Gee, Scourge and Robotnik both, they really don't think things through, do they? What the hell? Why is Sonic just letting a swap by grab him? Why the hell didn't he just run at Sonic's speed the minute Swap Pots came in and destroy all of them instead of standing there listening to Eggman like a dope? But this is like a comic book version of cutscene incompetence. Everyone gets thrown into the water outside the city. Even Scourge, almost, who panics saying that this wasn't part of the plan. Also, Ratted Out means being snitched on, which he isn't. Oh, thank god, finally he fights back! He awesomely punches two swap bots multiple times in a row at sonic speed, and says the badass line, This'll teach you not to mess with me. Yes! Sally orders Rotor to save Tails because he's the quickest swimmer, naturally since he's a walrus and has already been shown to be able to swim. Shouldn't Tails be able to swim just by flying underwater though? Like in Sonic 3? I guess the writers weren't aware he could do that, so he didn't know yet. Knuckles, Sonic, Sally, and Anti Knuckles are all not out in the water, so it looks like Eggman just arbitrarily told the swap to send Tails out to drown first, and not his most threatening enemy, Sonic the Hedgehog, or Bunny. Where is she anyways? Sick again? That's what happens when you eat rotten Fruit Loops. Anyways, Scourge gets in trouble looking nervous for once because he had revealed having a plan. Were they really that surprised? Why is he even scared? Why doesn't he just carefree shrugging it off? You'd think that someone arrogant would just be all like, Yeah, I'm not afraid of you. Maybe he thinks that they'll try to beat him up, but he can move at super speed. He doesn't think he can take him? I guess he thinks he'd be a coward if he ran away, and he has to run away because if he didn't, they'd all gang up on him and win. That's pretty smart of him to realize that they would win if they ganged up on him. You'd think someone truly arrogant would just assume that he would win. Sadly, him being interrogated on this makes him miss out on a cool chance to fight Robotnik for the thrills. Not that it was even necessary, since Sonic and Knuckles run out already knowing he was in cahoots with him before he could even say anything. I like how he lampshades his naivety. He didn't really know what he was dealing with, did he? 
Eggman tries to blast at Sonic and says a genuinely menacing line for once, that he's gonna make him wish he had stayed roboticized when he was through with him. Archimedes shows up, I guess through a portal, explaining that Robotnik had opened a gateway to the Prime Chaos Chamber, and naturally Knuckles was startled by him suddenly showing up. Archimedes tells the two Knuckles to follow his lead and avoid the particle beam, while Sally strategizes that Sonic and her will run in different directions to divert attention away from Knuckles. The two Knuckles reposition the Chaos Emeralds, and they make it reflect the beam of Eggman to once again send him to another dimension. As the emerald splits into several pieces from realistically breaking it having to reflect the beam. Why would Knuckles know that the laser was a teleporter if Sally didn't? What? Why do they have to place all the three why do they have to place all the six emeralds in their proper positions? Why does it matter which position they're in? They're all the same, aren't they? I mean they all have the same powers. Robotnik was going to destroy the Prime Knuckles' as Chaos Emerald so that it couldn't be used against him, as opposed to, you know, trying to steal it to use it for himself. Well, he does live in a world with 50 billion Chaos Emeralds, so maybe he doesn't see the harm in wasting one. Meanwhile, Scourge is still tied up, even though almost being thrown into the water to drown should have been punishment enough. And, you know, I think he could have helped. It would have been especially useful to have two Sonics running around. So while he did basically save the day by destroying the swap bots, other than that he wasn't really allowed to do anything. That sucks. And after Anti Knuckles gets everyone back from Atlantopolis, Rorta complains that he had anticipated using the remote scanner everywhere except where he had needed it. That only reminds me that both of the inventions he introduced ended up being useless in this issue. He never used the giant ray gun that's for emergencies either. It better get used eventually, because otherwise I'd say introducing it was just wasting comic space. Although it is nice to actually subvert Chekhov's gun for once, rather than making it played out and predictable by always using it. There's no backup story, by the way. This story was written by Ken Penders, and as a staple of his work, there were fascinating and brilliant concepts with flawed execution in the actual story. While there were a lot of things that really bugged me logic-wise, like why Sonic didn't destroy all the swap bots the minute they showed up, forcing Scourge of all people to save the day. In general, I loved the story and the concepts alone. I loved getting to see Anti Knuckles, because rather than being a bland, one-dimensional evil twin, he's actually a pacifist who thinks he'd never forgive himself for killing Knuckles, and he's Scottish for even more uniqueness, which they didn't even have to do that. And best of all, his Echidna Society is not only in a cool underwater city, but it's still really advanced, as if the whole Dimitri situation never happened there, probably because they actually had guardians for the Emerald all along, which makes perfect sense that it turned out to be that way in another reality. They really put a lot of effort in Santa Knuckles, I'm really impressed. I thought it'd be just like Knuckles. This is pretty brilliant. Although Scourge basically being with the Freedom Fighters in a plan with them was a missed opportunity because we never really got to see him interact with anybody. He just wisely stayed silent the whole time to avoid getting yelled at or something. So once again, he's smarter than he looks. You'd think that he would just pick a fight and argue with Sonic. We didn't get to see him having any real conversations with any of them. He was just there. But him getting to save the day was pretty awesome and a nice change of pace. But by far, the biggest missed opportunity with the story was it wasn't Boomer who was siphoning the emeralds. It wasn't even a new villain. It was just Robotnik again being shoved into a place where he didn't belong. Not to mention Scourge had been in cahoots with him, which was so boring and predictable. It would have been so much more interesting if it was Boomer or some other villain and Scourge was genuinely opposed to him. That would have been a nice diversion and made him a deeper character. But no, 